Age of Empires 2 has grown a lot over the past 20 years. Experts, intermediate players, low elo legends, and even boar lamers make up the community. These days many of the experts stream their gameplay, which allows lower level players to improve at a much faster rate. No matter your ranking, there's one thing that connects us all, the desire for competition. This desire constantly pushes us to improve in order to get those sweet, sweet wins. The satisfaction of seeing quantifiable improvement is hard to come by in everyday life. One of the best ways to improve is to watch replays of where you lost games and figure out the key points in which you lost the game. The point of this video is to help you understand exactly what those key points are that you're looking for. I've come up with four major categories based on how important they are. At the foundation we have fundamentals. This includes following a standard opening, understanding what each of the four resources are used for, basic scouting of resources in your base, boar luring, walling your base, using hotkeys for common units and technologies including adding custom hotkeys, understanding basic unit counters, and using a control group for your scout. Once you have the fundamentals down, you should work on your macro. This covers constantly building villagers, not getting housed, using wood as it comes in, keeping military production constantly producing when necessary, minimizing idle time, adding town centers in early castle age, and adding production facilities to match your economy. Macro is not something that's easy to master, and is something that can always be improved at any level. The first two categories can be improved on without paying any attention to what your opponent is doing. Once you have the fundamentals and macro at a decent level, you can start focusing on more overall strategy. This means you need to know the Civ matchups, be able to follow a standard build order, and adapt to the current state of the game. You also need to be able to scout properly and use the information that you get from scouting to inform your decisions. Understanding map control also helps a lot. Once I get into the details, you'll notice that scouting is very important at this phase. At lower levels, scouting is not as important as you won't be processing as much of the information that you get from scouting since you're thinking about more important things at the time, like producing villagers and houses. But once you get to a higher level, you'll start to use every bit of information you can get. And finally, once you've got a pretty good grasp of the game, it's time for the cherry on top, Micro. This allows you to more effectively use your units. This includes controlling villagers and military. Since villagers can build building foundations to block units from moving, there's a lot of fancy micro that you can do with them. Pretty much every unit is micro differently, so there's a lot to cover in this section. I'll go over the more common units to micro later on. Keep in mind that even though micro is flashy and fun to do, if you sacrifice your macro for it, it's often not worth it. Alright, before we get into the meat of things, I just want to clarify, this is not a step-by-step -step tutorial of the order in which you should learn things, but rather a checklist of what you can work on to help you reach the next level. It just means that when you're losing games, you should have a closer look at your macro before blaming your strategy choice. Anyways, there's many ways to get good at AoE, so let's go over a few of them. The first thing you should do when getting into a game with most civs is queue up villagers. Then, build a house with two villagers and another with the other one. Make sure to use two villagers that are close together to build the first house, and place it between them. You have to be pretty quick about this since villagers and houses both take 25 seconds to build. When two villagers build a house, it only takes 19 seconds, so you have 6 seconds to start building the house with two villagers, after you queue up your villagers. Next, send a sheep under your town center. If you don't see your sheep, send your scout as well as a villager to find them. If you see your sheep but don't have them converted, send your scout directly there. Once a sheep is going underneath your town center, select your villagers and shift queue them to the sheep. This way they'll go directly to the sheep without any downtime. On standard maps like Arabia, the next step is to find your additional herdables and two boars. The additional herdables can be either three cows or four sheep, or the equivalent big herdable and small herdable. Let's talk a bit about each of the four resources. Food is the most important resource early on as it's used to create villagers and advance to the next age. It can be gained in many different ways, each with varying gather rates. The most important thing to keep in mind is that hunters work faster than shepherds, farmers, and foragers, so it's really important to bring in your boars. I made an app on Heroku that has all of the gather rates listed for each resource if you're interested in more details. In addition to villagers and age-ups, food is used for all barracks and stable units, and most technologies. This means that if you want to build infantry or cavalry, you're going to need to structure your economy around gathering food. This means that you have to add lots of farms, but the exact number of farms depends on what units you're trying to build. Again, check out my Heroku app to see the exact numbers. Okay, next up is wood. Wood is most importantly used to build buildings. It's also used as the main resource when building siege, and usually the secondary resource when building archery range units. 
Wood income is tied to food income in that it costs wood to build farms, so once you've depleted all your berries and animals, you must have wood income in order to maintain food income. It takes one Dark Age lumberjack to pay for constant reseeding of three Dark Age farms. This means that in the time it takes three farmers to deplete three farms with 175 starting food, one lumberjack collects 180 wood to reseed the farms. This improves drastically with upgrades. For example, with two-man saw and crop rotation, one villager that's chopping wood can maintain 13 farms. Usually you have your rally point from your town center set to wood, so you usually don't really have to think too hard about collecting it. And finally we have gold and stone. Gold is used for generally stronger units such as the archer and knight, and stone is used for defensive structures like the castle and town center. You usually don't have to take either of these resources in the Dark Age, but you do need to collect 200 gold in order to advance to the Castle Age. It's really important to know how many villagers to put on gold to maintain unit production so that you don't end up having too much or too little gold. For example, you need 4 on gold to make archers constantly and 7 to make knights. The important thing about stone is that you need 100 per town center and it's pretty standard to go 3 town centers in Castle Age. You start with 200, so you usually don't have to mine stone until you want a castle, but if you build a tower or outpost early, then you'll have to collect stone early as well. Though I mentioned earlier that scouting is not the most important thing at lower levels, it's still essential to find key resources in your base. Different maps have different resource distributions, and I'll be using Arabia as the standard for what you should look for. The most important resources to scout right away are hurdles and boars, and a woodline. For the woodline, you usually want to take one in the back of your base so it's easier to defend. On Arabia, different types of hurdle animals can spawn. There are three different sets that are possible. It could be eight small animals, four small animals and three big animals, or six big animals. There will always be a large group close to your town center, and two smaller groups a bit further away. You also get either two wild boars or one rhinoceros and one elephant. Once you find your sheep and boars, you'll want to find your gold mines. You should have a main gold that has 7 tiles, and two secondary golds with 4 tiles each. Usually you'll want to mine your main gold first as it'll last longer, and you can get more villagers working efficiently on it, but sometimes you should take a secondary gold first if it's in the back of your base, further from your opponent. You should also have a herd of either 3 or 4 deer, or equivalent small huntable animal. A higher level technique is to push the deer to your town center with your scout, but usually you'll place a mill next to them to take them. If the deer are too close to your opponent, you may want to skip taking them, as it may put your villagers in danger. The final resource you should look for is stone. You should have a main stone with 5 tiles, and a secondary stone with 4 tiles. Don't worry if you can't find all of your golden stone mines right away. As long as you know the location of one of them, you'll be fine. The last thing in the fundamental section that you need to scout is the location of your opponent's base. This will allow you to know where to send your units when you want to attack, as well as where the enemy will probably come from to attack you. Once you've scouted the essentials, you can safely put your scout on auto scout to scout the rest of the map. Of course there are other things you could be scouting, but we'll cover them in the strategy section. Next up, let's learn how to lure boars. There are a few ways to do this. The most basic is to shoot the boar with a villager once, and then run back under the town center. Be careful not to task the villager to a resource, as this makes the villager attack the boar when the boar tries to eat him. Once the boar is underneath the town center, shoot it with all other villagers that are there. You may need to garrison the luring villager so he doesn't die. The second way to lure is to shoot it with the town center. This is my preferred way of doing it, as it reduces idle time and saves villager HP. The risk of doing it this way is that if you kill the boar with the town center, the meat will disappear. You can reduce the chances of this happening by understanding a few things. When villagers shoot the boar, they only do 3 damage per hit, whereas an arrow fired from the town center does 5. Boars have 75 HP, so if you shoot it once with the luring villager, you can garrison 7 villagers and shoot it twice to get it to 2 HP. If you accidentally shoot it twice with the lure, however, you'll kill the boar this way. It's best to garrison 6, but you can also garrison 3 or 4 villagers to shoot the boar. With 6 villagers garrisoned, shoot the boar twice. With 4, shoot it 3 times, and with 3, shoot it 4 times. Once the boar is weakened, use the set rally hotkey and right click the boar, and then ungarrison to finish it off. A useful idea to keep in mind is that you can block the boar with your scout when luring from a long distance. This will allow you to take less damage from the boar. There's another way to lure the boar, and that's with the scout. With the scout you have to hit the boar twice in order to make it chase you. This is mainly used to steal an opponent's boar, or on an island's map where you don't really care about your scout's HP. You have to make sure that your scout stays within the line of sight of the boar, otherwise it'll run back to its starting position. The boar's line of sight is 3, while most scouts have 4 line of sight. 
If an opponent is laming your boar, there's a couple of ways to stop it. You have to use your scout to either block the boar from chasing and hope that your opponent leaves its line of sight, or you have to block the opponent's scout so that it gets eaten by the boar. Either way, you need to be able to click back and forth really fast in order to pull these tricks off. If you've ever been attacked by archers or scouts, you'll know how important walling can be to prevent the opponent from doing too much damage. The way that you decide to wall your map comes down to many factors such as map layout, civilization choices, and strategy. There are a few things to keep in mind when you're walling. Make sure that your base isn't too small. If your base is too small, archers will still be able to shoot your villagers over the walls, and you'll have a hard time expanding later on. Make sure your walls aren't too far away. If your walls are too far away, you'll have trouble repairing them or making another layer behind since your villagers will be nowhere near them. Also, you risk losing your walling villager to the enemy scout and militia, or wolves. Try to incorporate buildings that are not palisade or stone walls into your wall. Since you need to build other buildings anyways, you might as well build them as part of your wall so you can save resources, as well as strengthen the wall. This can be a good way to add extra houses so you don't forget, though at higher levels you can't really afford to build extra houses early. Usually you don't need stone walls. Stone walls cost more and take longer to build than palisade walls. It's better to have a palisade wall that's finished than a stone wall that's only half done. Stonewalling when you're up against Eagle Warriors or Siege, however, or when you're going for extra town centers with no military can sometimes be effective. If you can wall to the edge of the map, it's usually best to do so. Walling to the edge of the map makes it so that the enemy can't get behind your base, which means that they can't fully surround you. It also reduces the enemy army's mobility, which means that they have to walk the long way around to get to the other side of your base. If you do it this way, you'll usually end up having to build less walls as well, so you'll save resources there. Be careful when placing gates. Not only do they allow for more melee units to attack them at once, they also only have 2 pierce armor, compared with 5 pierce armor from palisade walls. This means that archers will be able to easily get through them, whereas it takes a really long time for archers to get through palisade walls. Usually a single gate at the front of your base is all you'll want. When leaving your base from other sides, it's often better to just delete a section of wall and then rebuild it behind once the units are through. There are probably more tips on walling that I could think of, but we'll leave it at that for now. You'll notice when higher level players play, they do things so quickly that you can't actually explain in real time exactly what they're doing. The way that they do this is by utilizing many different hotkeys. Let's take a look at the difference between using hotkeys and not. On top, I'm using only the mouse to play, whereas on the bottom I'm using both the mouse and keyboard. The actions that I do in the game are exactly the same, but you'll see with hotkeys, everything is much faster. My point is, is that learning hotkeys is a requirement if you want to get faster at playing. Being able to do things faster will allow you to do more fun things as well, like microing your units. With hotkeys, you don't have to learn them all at once. For example, if you're going archers one game, force yourself to always use the archer hotkey to build archers instead of clicking them. At first this will be slower than clicking, but with a bit of practice you'll develop muscle memory which will make it much faster. I'll just real quickly show a few important changes to my hockey setup that I've made. I mostly use the default ones, but there are a few differences. I set my garrison hotkey to E. It's much easier to press and it's really important to be able to do this quickly and accurately, as it's often the difference between losing a unit and not. Set rally is changed from T to Q. Again, it's just a bit easier to press accurately. In game commands, there are hotkeys for selecting all of a certain building. You'll want to use this most of the time when selecting military buildings. These are preset to the fairly inaccessible hotkey of Control plus Shift plus another key. I've just set these to a single button. There's a related button which centers the camera on a specific building. This one's useful for when you need to go to that building to set rally points individually, or cancel units that you accidentally queued up. I have this hotkey set to control plus whatever hotkey I have set for the select all of that building. For example, I have select all archery ranges on T, and then go to archery range on control plus T. Doing it this way basically means that you can learn two hotkeys in one. There's one more hotkey idea that I want to show you here. I have go to lumber camp on control and Z, then I set the wood upgrades to Z. Then I can quickly press Ctrl Z and then just Z to research the wood upgrade. Seeing as you should be getting the wood upgrades as soon as you reach the next age most of the time, it's worth it to set this. I do the same for mill, but use X as the hotkey. As with most questions in Age of Empires 2, they can be answered with a simple it depends. When it comes to unit counters, a lot of the time who wins the battle depends on positioning and micro. For example, knights counter archers in an open plane, but archers can beat knights in a small choke point. I'm not going to go over every unit counter in the game, as that would take hours, but there are a few basic unit counters that you should know about that are usually true. 
The Spearman line does a ton of bonus damage against cavalry, but they also take a bunch of bonus damage from ranged units. Because of this, they're good at fighting non-ranged cavalry. Even if they don't win one-on-one -on -one with heavy cavalry, since pikemen are so cheap they trade cost-effectively with knights. This means that if you fight with equal resources invested into both armies, the pikemen will win. Archers are good against infantry with low pierce armor, such as men-at-arms and pikemen. They're also really great at picking off villagers. Skirmishers do very well against archers and cavalry archers due to their high pierce armor and bonus damage against them. Melee cavalry units are very good against skirmishers and siege due to the minimum range of these units and the cavalry's ability to close the distance fast. Siege units such as the mangonel and scorpion are good against tightly packed units since they deal area of effect damage. This means they can take down large groups of ranged units effectively. Monks convert knights faster than other units, so it can be a good idea to have a few monks if you're up against a bunch of knights. To counter monks, you'll want light cavalry or eagle warriors, as these units resist conversion and have an attack bonus against monks. Anyways, these unit counters are just a brief overview for now, and probably deserve their own video one day. The final thing I wanted to talk about is something fundamental that you should do, is put your scout in a control group. This will allow you to press that number to select your scout. If you control group your scout, you'll probably remember to use it more, which becomes very important as you get better at the game. In the next video, I'll be covering macro. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you there.